So for 30 years, being a weekend angler, having a full-time job, nine to five, you don't, you know, you, you're arriving at the lake at six o'clock, it's dark at four. I'm turning up to a venue now, like I did many, many times. Didn't have a clue what I'm fishing, where I'm fishing, just have to go on your, on your instinct. So uh, I'm actually relishing the challenge. Well, that's three bags tied, ready to go. It's the witching hour now, it's midnight, and uh, we, you know, we're casting a bit blind, but um, we're gonna go out into the wet, the cold, and the wilderness, and uh, hotefully, next time I see you, I'll be holding one of these lovely Cotswold carp. Right, well I can finally see the lake, now it's light. Um, I've seen a couple of fish roll, which is quite encouraging, knowing that you're in the right area. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit smaller than I was anticipating, being that you, know, you see it in the dark and it looks different in the daylight. And uh, I think I'm gonna have to do a lap, lap around the lake soon, um, have a little walk around, look for sort of clouded up areas, just see what's, you know, just see what's occurring. Um, just see whether I've got a better opportunity somewhere else. But I think, um, you know, looking, looking where I am and seeing the two fish roll you know, at first light, it's, uh, it's very encouraging. I had a liner on the middle rod, so I know that there's fish in this area. So um, I, I think, you know, now, now, uh, now I can see the lake, I think I'll probably overcast a little bit. Um, it looked wider than it actually is. You know, that's the first thing I'm gonna uh, attack is, is redoing the rods. Um, and that's, uh, it's given me encouragement seeing the two fish over there. So I might even, so I might even put all, well, I'll put two rods over where I've seen the fish roll and I'm gonna keep one on that little inlet pipe and uh, where you know it's been murking up down there apparently uh, according to the lads yesterday so um so that's yeah that's all i can all i can sort of ascertain at the moment is that um i'm in kind of i'm in the general area so uh fingers crossed What I've seen over there, um, it's pretty, pretty encouraging to be fair. You know, it's uh, very cold weather and sometimes they do huddle up and, and this is exactly what they've done. And uh, they're right out literally in front of me, but I've seen fish rolling 
probably about 70, 80 yards, but I'm watching bubblers as we speak, uh, and they're actually closer in. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna just put three rods between that little zone. I'm gonna do probably one at about 80, one at 70, one at 60. Just so if they are moving up and down the, uh, that area for some reason, if they're nailing the last sort of remaining bloodworm, um, we, 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 we're in the zone. We've got, we've got a chance, you know, three, three different staggered bags and uh, just one tiny little manila hook bait. So uh, it's encouraging, that's all, I can, that's all I can say. So let's get the first bag out. That's three out. Uh, I've put two 60 yard, well, one 60 yard, one 70 yard. That one's probably gone, that's probably gone about 90. And that's fell into a, uh, a much deeper hole. So uh, maybe that's why they're sort of collected around that area. I don't know without, you know, without really, really sort of uh, leading about too much, which I don't want to do. And that's the whole idea of using the bags is that you're not alarming the carp and uh, I'm not spooking them out of the area they want to be in. So. Uh, so that's quite encouraging. I'm quite happy with that. I've got two rods on fizzers and a couple of fish that are boshed closer in. And that one is where we've seen the bulk of the fish boshing out there this morning. And I've just put that last bag right on where they were boshing. So um, I can't really, at the moment, do a lot more than I've done. So that's the advantage of having, uh, having daylight. That's, uh, that's three, three rods right where they are. I can't really, uh, can't really ask for any more now, just uh, a little bit of luck. Churn Pool, four acres in size, a little smaller than I thought, but what a beautiful lake. It's set in the uh, Cotswold countryside, right in the Churn Valley. We've got the River Churn running behind the lake, which is a tributary to the River Thames. Gin clear, it's shaped like a dog bone. In the, in the middle it narrows and then you've got two bowls, one either end. It's been flooded, uh, there's been a lot of rainwater going into the lake, so it's a little bit of a worry. Fish-wise, I don't really know what's in here, which is quite exciting. I deliberately didn't look at the website, but I have seen some gorgeous fish, including 40 pound commons, up on the wall. I'm hoping we're gonna get one of them. Right, we've got into, uh, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. The fish that we had rolling this morning, well, fortunately, they're still there. But a uh, little tactical change. I'm gonna make up three new withies and uh, I'm gonna use the Buka Berry hook baits. That's something that whenever I've had to steal a bite and uh, you know, get, and get, the, get the fish to honing in on one bright hook bait, uh, the Buka Berries have done it for me. They've done it last, last winter. Um, you know, up, up at Linear, um, done really well with the Buka Berries. It's an age old thing that Rod Atchison told me about years ago. It's uh, an acidic fruit with an essential oil. Absolutely, it, it, it really is a key hook bait to, uh, to winter fishing. You know, for some reason, they really do like the essential oil in the winter. So I've opted to put on three pop ups because I've had critically balanced uh, dumbbell wafters out there and uh, I've had a bream. <laughs> it's okay, it's a fish, it's a feeding fish. We know that they're in the area. Um, it, it was one of those, it's been a funny day, it's blown a northerly, it's blown, blown a, a westerly uh, and then it went really, ca really calm and sunny and then I started seeing fish on the surface and uh, technically I should have probably put a zig out. Don't really like zig fishing, um, if, if it comes to it I might have to try that tomorrow but today the tactical change is before it gets dark, it's, we've only got two hours left, I'm going to make up the three withies and, um, and we're going to use the Buka Berry hook baits. Same, same method in the, in the solid bag. I'm just going to steam, steam the wivy. I'll steam it out straight and then just let it set. And then I'll just get hold of the hook link, pull it up like so. Just like a little bow and arrow that is. 
So, so the, 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 the shrink tube's running exactly parallel with the hook. Just give it a quick flash over there. And that's the wivy done. But the only, the only difference is now, I'm gonna use the little uh, Thinking Angler's five mil tungsten bead. That says my shot. And that goes about 10 mil from, from where the shrink tube is. So we can put, turn this off now and put a hook bait on. There's certain things you've got to do in carp fishing and there's, over the years I've implemented many, many things and I've noticed, you know, even up till now you're still learning, you know, it's, uh, n nobody knows everything and uh, a carp react in many different ways, you know, air pressures, low pressures, high pressures, sun, it's a massive influence in, in, in winter angling and what you've got to understand is, it, it, from, from my own experience, is that that wind of opportunity, like last winter I was fishing, I, I was fishing Lynch Hill and there was literally, it was two hours, um, two hours out of 24 that I was getting the bites at. So I made sure I was ready three or four hours before and everything set, I was spotting out bloodworm pellet, ground up manila boilie. I wasn't giving them whole boilies, I was ground, grinding it into powder, almost like baby food, like, you know, and uh, where they weren't, they weren't gonna fill themselves up and they're searching around and if they do something, they see one solid object, which I was gr cutting down the, uh, the dumbbell wafters, and using it with a wivy because that's a lot of uh, you know a lot of a lot of people think you can't use like a, a rig like the wivy rig or, or with a wafter but you can you can use it with a bottom bait um and i found that once i'd whittled down these dumbbell wafters in a little solid bag of bloodworm pellet the 2.3 mil dub bloodworm pellet that was really the key that was key to the, the, the success i had last winter it's just it's, it's done me it's done me so many fish and so many big fish last winter you know i, I had the best winter I've ever had coming back to carp fishing after having a four and a half year sort of layoff and uh, I just thought just put the best out there and that's what I did I went to seven different waters had 30s and 40s from most of them and uh, it was a phenomenal winter. Coming into winter it presents many challenges, but I think the, the main one is, is daylight hours. You're talking about daylight at 7.30 in the morning till up past three in the afternoon. So you've got a very small window of opportunity to get things right. So that's key because, you know, carp might only feed two hours of the day. It might be at night. So getting everything bang on in the daytime is quite important to, you know, the limited hours that you've got and, and we're faced with as winter anglers. Okay, it's the end of the day. We had a, well, pretty short day. We were talking about daylight hours earlier. I've had to really peruse the lake, find out what's going on. I've followed some carp around. They're staying in this little sort of triangle. Let's call it the Bermuda Triangle. Out in front of me, uh, they've been on the top. They've been boshing. They've been quite happy. Um, they, were, they were fizzing this morning. So hopefully I'll be in the correct areas for the morning. If it is morning time, hopefully there'll be a night feeding time as well. So uh, we've we'll, we've got fingers crossed. I had a little change of tactics with the uh, with the pop-ups. Gone for something a little bit more fruity. Um, I'll explain and reveal all if it works in the morning. So uh, like I say, it, it, following the sun come out for about two hours today, and boom! As soon as that sun come out, the fish were up near the top. You know, we're nearly into December here, and. Uh, that's what happens on gin clear waters, especially uh, the ones I've fished anyway. I can only speak from my own experiences, and they were there on the top. Um, we could see them, could see them in the edges, and they've been they've been quite happy, quite bos boshing about. Could have put a zig out, didn't want to. I want to catch one on the bottom on the methods we've been showing. So uh, I've got the same methods out there, just a slight change on the hook bait. Gone for a pop up because there was quite a bit of detritus on the bottom. I was fishing a wafter yesterday, last night, and today. And I, I picked up quite a bit of quite a bit of um, sort of leafage and a bit of weed and whatever. So I've gone for a pop up and, uh, and a nice fruity um, sort of essential oil buka berry pop up. So uh, I've got fingers crossed. Pray that we can uh, have one to show you by the morning.
So we went into last night really full of enthusiasm and a uh, little change of tactics, change to the, uh, the Bookerberry pop-ups, which has done me loads of fish when it's been tough. Having a look at what happened on the lake, I was, I was that, that enthusiastic. I sat out on the veranda very early on, sat there listening for fish. They weren't crashing like they were before. The, the, the pressure went really high and uh, I was expecting a bite, maybe sort of two, three o'clock, didn't transpire. Um, it's just one of them, it's winter fishing. You have to stay enthusiastic. So I, I, I still have my fingers crossed, first light, maybe if there was a bite at first light didn't happen. Uh, I had a walk round, baited up some areas uh, in the bushes that we saw them yesterday. I baited up eight separate areas. I had another walk round two hours later, all the bait's still there. So they're definitely not in the edges. And I've, I've seen them up near the top. Um, so opted to take off the, uh, the, the, the solid bag rigs because I just thought, you know, uh, when I checked the rods this morning, the line was right up on the surface and I've had this, I've experienced this before. And when that's happened, the fish have come up. I think it's almost, you know, it's uncomfortable for them. Uh, so they adjust the swim bladders up, they come, and it's, it's, a, it's a lot lot more comfortable for them to be up near the top layers. So uh, I've opted, which I don't really like doing, but I've had to do it, trying to, trying to get a bite. You've got to keep going, whatever, you know, whatever winter throws at you, you've got to keep going. So I've put zigs on, tried them out at 12 foot, and, uh, and now I've brought them, brought them back in. Um, it hasn't had a bite in two hours, so I've, uh, I've brought them down to probably about nine and a half foot and just, just had a little chuck round to the right hand side. I see a few fish underneath the surface again and, uh, and I've chucked them out to the right hand side. So uh, fingers crossed, we'll, uh, you know, still got part, best part of today to go, which as we spoke about the other day, it's uh, the light hours are, are very small. So uh, I've got fingers crossed for a bite. Withy pool rig, invented that 30 years ago. Literally, it was to overcome a problem. We were using um, these big long hooks, kind of like fly hooks, and we were bending them. And uh, it, it was prevalent that they were far better than any other rig we'd ever used. But the problem was we were damaging the fish's mouths. And as a syndicate in, uh, in sort of 89, 90 season, we decided to, um, to ban the rig we were using. And, uh, I first come up with this, we didn't have shrink tube in those days. It wasn't about, we didn't have the internet, shock horror. We didn't have mobile phones. Everything was done by word of mouth and in secret. And those were the days, they were the halcyon days of carp angling. You know, we could literally, we carved out rigs in those days. And, uh, and the Wivy was the first kind of technological carp rig to, to kind of, well, hit the market at the time. It wasn't really a market even, you know, it was, it was too early for those stages. It, you know, everything was done through, uh, through the carp society, through, you know, through people talking about going to a different lake. Oh, have you seen this rig? Have you seen that rig? And they were exciting days. Everything's, everything's so easy to come upon now and, and people to claim this, claim that. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's one of those, it's the, the, the Wivy, um, what I did in the initial stages, we didn't have shrink tube. We used to have this some um, this sort of softish. It was semi-stiff tubing. And what I, what I did is I used a float stop, and I curved as I pushed it. It curved, and I thought that's perfect. That that kind of replicated what we had on this um you know on, on, on this kind of like bent hook rig, and uh, and that was the initial first Wivy pool rig. And uh, as soon as I used it, Wivy had 17 carp in it, and the first um, the first first time I used it. I had, uh, I think it was nine bites I had out of Wivy, which was unheard of. It's one of the diff most difficult lakes in the country. I used to have to travel 125 miles just to catch a 30, maybe a 40. In those days, they were massive fish, massive. You know, every lake's got them now. Um, but in those days, we had to make the real effort, you know? So everything had to be, I was traveling 250 mile round trip every other weekend, sometimes every weekend in my little van. I was spending all my wages on, on, on fuel. Over the years, I've tried it with all sorts of stiff materials, the, the coated skin materials, which I don't like because I think the carp can detect them easily. Um, I like a, a, a nice supple braid. Uh, I mean, ideally, I'd like to use it with fluorocarbon, but it doesn't work as well. Um, that, that flexibility is what you want. You know, that hook is, is totally detached as such from the hook link, uh, from the, the hook bait, sorry. And uh, so I opt to use it now because of my paranoia um, and a uh, bit of OCD, I put it into a solid bag. So I curl up, curl up the hook link. It's got a little element of travel. By the time it sucks it in, no, no matter which way that carp takes it from, it'll flip onto the bottom lip. 
Uh, we did a test many, many years ago. Um, I can't remember which magazine it was. And they did this test and they put some rubber on, on some, they made this sort of carp's head, if you like. And the Wivy was the one that caught nine out of 10 times. All the other rigs, the closest to it was four out of 10. And uh, it proved how deadly the Wivy is. People think that it's a very, very difficult rig to make. It really isn't a difficult rig to make. Firstly, I'll take 10 inches of the new Duo Fleck hook link from Fink and Anglers. Been on test for a year, fantastic. I use it with all the solid bags, nice and supple, and that's pretty key to using the wivy. You want a supple material. I tie it on with a five turn grinner knot onto the size seven curve point. Don't use the big hooks, you don't need to because the, the, the shrink tube accentuates the size, of the size of the hook. So tying that on, five turn grinner knot, I take off an inch and a quarter of shrink tube, slide it up the hook link, just slightly over the eye. And then we put on the five mil tungsten bead. So easy as that. You then put on, one of the best things that Finger and Anglers does for me for the Wivy rig is their little hook ring swivel. It's, it's Teflon coated and the way that it allows the hook to spin, it's, it's amazing. It literally has ups the hooking potential of the Wivy 30%. So 30 years on, it's being improved. So that goes on and then you put on the hook bead. Now the hook bead, it's not critical where you put it, but if you put it just the bottom part of the hook bead, just above the, uh, where the, the barb is, it's perfect and then the wivy will sit, sit perfectly once you've shrunk it down. So that's the next stage. You hold the shrink tube dead straight, and I, I always make sure the shrink tube is literally enshrouding the whole eye of the hook because it holds it in place and it doesn't move about. If you have it halfway, it can, it can twist over and it's not what you want, you know? It, it's just having it solid so it's perpendicular with, the, with the, the point of the hook, you want that exactly in the same spot for it to hook efficiently and in the, in the bottom of the, the, the middle of the bottom lip. You hold it out straight, you steam it, and once it's steamed straight, leave it for about three, four seconds and it will just be dead straight like so. And then what I do is I get hold of the hook link and then I hold it round like a little bow and arrow. And then what you don't want to do is over, over um, do the curve with the bow and arrow because once you put it on the steam, that initially wants to, it wants to make more of a curve. So if you do less of a curve, it will give you, once you steam it, more of a curve. And that is the Wivy ready to go. And it's speaking to all the tuitions I've done this year, they thought that that was one of the hardest rigs to tie. And then by the time they've done the tuitions, they've gone, that's the easiest rig to tie. It's even easier than the basic complicated, which I find a bit difficult to believe, but everyone's gone away and not one of those tuitions cannot tie the wivy. It's that easy to tie. Right, here we go, last knockings. It's, uh, I had to change the zigs because they were all, uh, I noticed they were all up on the top. I don't like zig fishing, but it's kind of uh, going to save the day. The air pressure is not a ripple on the water. The fish have been up in the upper layers. My only option was to go against something that I don't like using, but I hooked one about an hour ago and unfortunately it took me in a weed bed. And, uh, oh, I just hope this isn't in the wee bed. No, he's out. Um, I think it's a good fish. And the other one got into this wee bed and that's where zigs are not great because the, uh, the, the hook holes are not as good. But it's done us two bites and it's come off. You're joking me. Hook link's cut. Kyle's not long, to say. <laughs> Absolutely devastated. Yeah, there we go. Well, <laughs> great session, sad session. Come to the end of it, 36 hours of ups and downs. Glorious venue, Chernpool, somewhere I'm definitely, definitely coming back to. I love the place, uh, but it's been tricky. We've had the weather elements, which we spoke about, 
all the way through the session. I've had to change things. I've put on the dreaded zig rig, especially in waters like this. It's a, you know, it's a Cotswold gravel pit with loads of bricks in it and weed, onion weed. Uh, it's got zebra mussels all over it. And I've hooked, I hooked one, took me straight into a weed bed, lost it. Don't know whether it's a big fish. Absolutely, obviously devastated when you're doing filming, especially, you know, coming into the winter. It's, uh, it's not an easy ask anyway on a brand new lake. So uh, put the rods back out on the zigs, lowered them down to sort of three quarter, three quarter up to the surface. And uh, I've had an absolute belter at the end of the day as we're just wrapping up the filming and I've looked an absolute beast. Uh, I mean, there's two 40 pound commons in here, not saying it was one of them. The first fish, don't know what that was. It felt okay, felt good. That one I had on for five minutes and it was taking loads of line. Wasn't zigzagging like doubles do or twenties. It was a big fish, definitely 30 plus. I'd, I'd stake my house on it and uh, but so yeah devastated absolutely devastated and, and, and not to lose it to a hook pull it's gone down into a weed bed and the zebra mussels the, the hook link was chafed all the way up and uh, it's just cut through it wasn't man enough and that's why sometimes I don't like lose, uh, using zig rigs but there you go highs and lows you can't have it all all the time and uh, and that's that's you know that keeps it real um, going to go home very dejected man and uh, but what that will do it's a lesson carp fishing is always a story and, uh, and next time I'll try and get it I'll try and get even <laughs> that's that, that, that that's how I work inside internally I will come back to Churnpool and uh, hopefully put a hook in a big fish again.